So I took a bit of a risk this morning, um, and I figured nobody was ever, ever going to give me the opportunity to walk down a catwalk in a tutu ever again. So I grasped it with both hands. Thank you. Thank you for being here for this. <laughs> I am incredibly, incredibly proud to be here to um, present the work that is going on at Genomics England. And if anybody is ever confused, you will often hear of us being refer referred to, as Gordon did, um, as GEL. Um, so that is Genomics England Limited. So when you hear about the amazing things that GEL is doing, it's us. Um, I. Uh, absolutely love my job at Genomics England. I cannot even begin to describe to you how much I love it. And I'm very passionate about the work we do. And one of the reasons for that is that I myself have a genetic disorder which causes a severe visual impairment. So if I drive my slides completely recklessly, please forgive me, I cannot see them very well. Okay, so um, just to give you a little bit of background about Genomics England, aware that not everybody here is from the UK um, genomics ecosystem. So uh, Genomics England was set up in uh, 2013 uh, to sequence and analyze 100,000 genomes from uh, the NHS of rare, rare disease and cancer patients. So, I mean, you can imagine in 2013 what's a, an audacious goal that was for us to have. Um, in 2018, uh, the 100,000th genome was, in fact, sequenced, um, and that laid the groundwork for whole genome sequencing uh, becoming part of routine clinical care for patients in England um, who have eligible, uh, who are affected by eligible conditions. Um, and we continue to move forward and do amazing things. So I will be talking to you about what we are doing in the cancer space, uh, which is a program we refer to as Cancer 2.0. Okay, so we hold a very unique position within the uh, UK genomic ecosystem. We provide a service to the NHS um, for whole genome sequencing, and any data which is consented for research, we then make available to um, academic and research partners, um, as well as industry, to be able to drive innovation and research, which will make its way back into the clinic. So the 100,000 Genomes Project, of course, was not just about sequencing a huge number of genomes. We're very, very proud of the things which we managed to accomplish during that project. Um, so more than 6,000 rare disease patients received diagnoses which they may not otherwise have received. Um, and for the cancer cases that we saw, we returned actionable variants for about 50% of them. Okay, so in terms of what we're trying to do as an organization in the cancer space, um, we received funding from the UK government in 2021 to look at how new technologies could benefit cancer patients in terms of how um, diagnostics and treatments work in the future. So there are two main parts to this. Um, I will unsurprisingly be talking about the long read sequencing part of this but there is also uh, the multimodal data aspect. Um, so the multimodal data, although I won't be speaking about it, if you'd like to look into it, we are making radiology and pathology images available in addition to the genomic data which we make available. Okay, so in terms of what we are trying to achieve in the, in the long read sequencing program, um, I, I don't think any of these things will be surprising given the, what we know about the technology. Um, we are looking to drive faster diagnostics um, through being able to distribute sequencing and through more flexible uh, batching. Um, we, are, um, uh, we are trying to um, provide more comprehensive genomic data uh, and methylation data for each patient. So instead of running many tests, we would like to just run one test. Um, and we are, as an organization, always scanning the sequencing um, horizon to make sure that we always use the correct tool for the job. And the part which is very exciting is that we are trying to find a path to equitable access for this technology um, 
through the piloting of, of the technology within seven sites um, across the NHS, um, and that is for four clinical indications, ALL, AML, um, sarcoma, and CNS tumors. And given what most of you probably know about long read sequencing, it's obvious why we've chosen these uh, particular cancers. So complex rearrangements, need for fast turnaround time in some of them, and the need for methylation data in CNS tumors. Okay, so what are we trying to evidence that we can do during this pilot? Um, firstly, we need to be able to show that we can find the correct variants or the correct biomarkers or the correct mutational signatures, um, that we can do it at the right time. So in cancer, uh, the patient's clinical journey is very complex and many treatment decisions need to be taken quickly. So the timing is incredibly important. Um, we want to do it in a way that isn't going to uh, cause disruption in a clinical setting, and we want to be able to do it at the correct cost. Okay, so what do we need to do to be able to get there? Um, we need to be able to uh, run the sequencing technology at scale, um, which our research and development sequencing team uh, led by Greg Elgar um, and his incredible team, I'm very grateful to be able to uh, present some of their work, uh, have already been doing this. Uh, we need to know about the methodology which is required for whole genome sequencing of cancers, which is often different to sequencing other types of samples. Um, and we need to develop a pipeline. <laughs> I say that like it's small. This has been a, a, a very a big part of this and the most exciting part to me as somebody who was once upon a time a bioinformatician. Um, and we need to be able to, um, to translate what we have been able to do in our own R&D sequencing lab into um, a more clinical setting. So right now, as we speak, we have two Promethions which have gone to translational units um, within the NHS. So one is in Leeds and one is at the Royal Marsden Hospital. So we are tremendously excited about that. Um, and as we move out of that translatory phase, we will eventually test the end-to-end -end process across um, clinical sites. Okay, so this is just going to be a whirlwind tour of some of the scientific data which we have. Um, there are several members of my team here who will be able to give you more information about this, this data, so I hope to be able to make contact with as many of you as possible because I'm not doing this justice. Um, so uh, what I'd like to show you about this, and sorry, I was very tempted to try and point, but the pointer doesn't work. Um, we can't point on two screens. Um, is that uh, across 4,000 samples which we have run to date, um, and you can see how we are increasing these numbers in that top graph, and we uh, look forward to being able to run many, many, many more samples. We are getting good yield um, from flow, flow cells, um, and we are getting fragment lengths which are appropriate for the uses that we are trying to um, for the applications which we are going after. Uh, what's important to note is that these samples come from a variety of different cohorts. They were not extracted specifically for long reads. Um, they were extracted as part of other genetic testing um, that it was done, um, and we are still getting um, good enough fragment uh, lengths and, and um, yield. Okay, just, I don't want to fixate too much on the numbers. I'm sure lots of people from um, ONT themselves will be talking about base caller improvements. But just to give you an idea of what we've seen in the past few years as we've been engaged with this technology, is that each release of Guppy is giving us much, much better um, accuracy. And I'm not going to fuss about the accuracy too much um, in terms of, for us, what we consider to be important is can we detect the clinical variants that we need to be able to. Um, so, the one thing I do want to show is that uh, the blue dots on, on the uh, charts represent where we made the move to R10 flow cells. So, all previous data on this, the red, is um, from R9 flow cells. Okay, we did a lot of benchmarking um, of structural variant callers, um, and I 
cannot tell you how quickly this is moving. Um, we are very excited to have been able to witness ongoing developments within the community and to be involved in some of that um, development, which is very exciting for us to work in collaboration. Um, so we had set ourselves some clinical criteria, so in terms of run times, because as we said, we are concerned with the amount of time that we would take to be able to run a pipeline. Um, and in terms of the sensitivity, which is incredibly important, and the number of false positives. And of course, in a clinical setting, false positives are incredibly important because each one needs to be investigated by a clinical scientist. So this is rapidly moving. There are new versions of these callers coming out often, um, so this is not the, the be-all and end-all of this, uh, but we ha do have three callers which are which we are confident we will be able to continue to use. So those are Nanomon SV, um, Qt SV, and um, Savannah. Okay, this is the, the, these are, are, are the, the, the great things that I'm glad that I, I get to be the one to talk about in front of audiences. Um, this is a case um, of this uh, Renex-1 uh, fusion, which we were unable to see with short read sequencing, but you can see um, on the long read sequencing that we are very um, clearly able to see this breakpoint. And if you look at how just smooth that, I want to point at it and I can't, cannot, <laughs> how smooth the coverage is in that region um, where that breakpoint is if you look at the, the uh, first track on the top, um, the top of, um, of, the, of, of this um, IGV plot. Um, and just to say that this, where this breakpoint is, there is a, um, an AT repeat, which is why we think that we were not able to see this with the short read sequencing. Okay, um, this is another one. So this is um, a fusion, and again, I'm just going to keep pointing this out. Um, if you look at how smooth the coverage is um, in, in that top track, um, we are very, very um, able to see uh, where the breakpoint is um, versus in the short read sequencing. Um, and this, there is this um, sh short interspersed uh, nuclear elements, uh, which is difficult to map, which is why we think that this um, has been missed in the short reads. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk a little bit about promoter methylation. What I want you to know is that we are very, very in the beginning of this, um, so I'm not making any bold scientific claims. I just want to show you some data which we have thought has, in terms of the resolution of the data, is, is very clean and we are very happy to be able to get it. Um, so when we return the... Um, whole genome sequencing, as I said, we would like to be able to return all the things that you would have been able to get from other tests at the, at the same time. So that includes uh, the methylation of biologically important promoters. Um, so in this case, um, we are looking at BRCA1 and RAD51C. Uh, so I, I'm aware that these uh, are probably quite small and I'm not sure, I don't understand how other people's eyes work. So um, I certainly can't see them, but you probably cannot see too much detail on them. But what I would like to say is um, we can see signal um, in these promoters. So, and we have clusters of, of very much where the CPG island has been uh, methylated across all of the CPG lo loci, um, and then we have a group of reads where, where none of them have been, have been methylated. Um, and it is to be able to see the resolution on this data compared to um, other means of being able to test this promoter methylation is just very, very, uh, it makes us very happy. Um, so just as a, as, as a slight test, um, we wanted to make sure that the, that the methylation that we were seeing in the promoters of the samples that we were looking at was in samples we would expect them to be in. Um, so if you look just at the bottom, um, the samples where we are seeing the, methylator promo uh, the methylation of the promoters is in um, homologous recombination deficient um, 
samples, but not in the homologous uh, recombination pr profession samples. So that was where we would expect to be able to see it. Okay, CNV callers. <laughs> this, one, this one is still ongoing, um, and it's one that we, would, we hope will move fast, um, and I'll tell you why this is still ongoing. So we have looked at nine CNV callers. Um, we have two that are performing very well for the most part. The others did not perform great um, for various reasons, which are, are generally quite typical of how um, software is. So things like being outdated. Um, there was one that um, didn't export VCFs, which seemed like a strange thing to not do. Um, and then this, this is the thing where, where we are hoping that we will um, see further developments happening in the, in the future. Um, so we have um, copy number of uh, variant callers that are, perform reasonably well, except in these situations where you have um, copy number neutral loss of heterozygosity. And um, in order to be able to do this type of um, CNV calling, you generally need to be able to use the uh, B allele fraction or, or um, frequency. So we are currently working with the developers of CNV PyTor, who are um, working on this feature currently. But this is, is something that we are hoping next year we will come back and tell you how amazingly um, we are able to detect these particular loss of heterozygosity variants. Okay, so <laughs> we very purposefully um, started working on the SNVs last um, because as many people, we thought this may be something where, where, where there may be future development which is required. And um, I'd like to say that we have actually been remarkably impressed in what we are already able to do. So the first thing that I'd like to point out is that the data that I am showing you now is on R9 cells, um, flow cells, not on R10 flow cells. So as I showed you in a previous slide, um, we are seeing a lot of improvement on um, R10 flow cells. So we expect to see improvements in our ability to be able to call these um, SNVs as well. Um, but even at um, on on the older flow cells, we are getting to a sensitivity of nearly 90% if the tumor purity is high enough, which is fantastic news. Okay, so in conclusion, um, WGS using ONT um, sequencing for cancer is looking clinically promising. Um, it is not yet clear whether it will be the right technology for all cancers. We have only started looking in, in the, yeah, excuse me, in the four. Um, yes, uh, and something that we are looking forward to greatly um, is, is to be able to um, add transcriptomics back into um, the mix when we talk about more comprehensive data. So we look forward, hopefully in the future, in the very near future, to be able to come back and to talk about um, that work. Excellent. So I, I had the pleasure of being able to present on behalf of so many people in the Genomics England team, um, and it's been a great honor to be able to do that. Thank you to our collaborators, and especially, especially um, thank you to the patients that make this work possible.